Well, good morning and welcome to you. It is Sunday the 21st of February. Big hello to the folks from Maxwell Church here in Comores eh, and our church family at the Tin Kirk in Ardeer as well. 
uh, and to all of you, wherever you happen to be uh, joining us from uh, this morning. Announcements for the week is just the one this week, and that is with respect to our growth groups. Uh, We will be restarting our growth groups again uh, a week on Wednesday, uh, the first week of March. Uh, So look out for more information on that this coming week on Facebook, where we will provide uh, access details to join us uh, on Zoom a week on Wednesday for the growth group. Now, one of the things that has been um, disappointing for us during uh, the the ongoing restrictions has been um, the fact that we've not been able to sing together uh, in church. Um, That's been a sad thing for us. But one of the um, great blessings, uh, certainly over the last year, has been that there's been a number of uh, great new uh, hymns that have been written by musicians Uh, during the course of this pandemic. And I was listening to one uh, earlier on this week, really picking up on that um, statement that Paul makes um, in his letter to the Corinthians, where he says that he uh, resolved to know nothing uh, while he was with the church in Corinth, except uh, Jesus Christ and him crucified. And This song really picks up on that statement that Paul makes, and we're going to uh, listen to it and hopefully be able to pick it up as we sing along to it uh, from our homes just now.
Well, it's the children's time of the service now, and we're going to have a look at a story from the Jesus Storybook Bible, and it is the story of when Jesus was with his disciples on a boat, and there was stormy weather. So let's have a look at that story now. The sun was going down, the air was warm and still. Let's go across the lake, Jesus said to his friends. Jesus had been helping people all day, and now he was tired. So they left the crowds at the shore and set out in the small fishing boat. Jesus climbed into the boat to take a nap. As soon as his head touched the pillow, he fell fast asleep. It was a beautiful evening. A gentle breeze rustled the sails. The friends were chatting happily as they headed out into the middle of the lake. Everything was perfect. Just right for a nice quiet sail. They were only about halfway across when, out of nowhere, whirling winds swept across the lake, fierce and strong like a hurricane. A blinding flash of lightning lit up the sky. Thunder roared. Right the storm blew the water into the narrow waves that hurled the little boat up, 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 and sent it hurtling, crashing back down, down, down. The fishing boat was blown and buffeted and tossed and turned back and forth and up and down and left and right and round and round. And in the middle of the storm, Jesus was sleeping. And Jesus' friends who had been fishermen all their lives but in all the years fishing on this lake. They had never once seen storm like this one. No matter how hard they struggled with their ropes and sails, they couldn't control their boat. This storm was too big for them. The storm wasn't too big for Jesus. Help, they screamed. Wake up. Quick, Jesus. Jesus opened his eyes. Rescue us. Save us, they shrieked. Don't you care? Of course Jesus cared. And this was the very reason he had come, to rescue them and to save them. Jesus stood up and spoke to the storm. Hush, he said. That's all. And the strangest thing happened. The wind and waves recognised Jesus' voice. They had heard it before, of course. It was the same voice that made them in the very beginning. They listened to Jesus and they did what he said. Immediately the wind stopped. The water calmed down. It glittered innocently in the moonlight and lapped quietly against the side of the boat. As if nothing had happened. The little boat bobbed gently up and down. There was a deep stillness and great quiet all around. Then Jesus turned to his wind-torn friends. Why were you scared, he asked. Did you forget who I am? Did you believe your fears instead of me? Jesus' friends were quiet, as quiet as the wind and the waves, and into their hearts came a different kind of storm. What kind of man is this? they asked themselves anxiously. Even the winds and the waves obey him, they said, because they didn't understand. They didn't realise yet that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus' friends had been so afraid they had only seen the big waves. They had forgotten that if Jesus was with them, they had nothing to be afraid of, no matter how small their boat or how big the storm. So that was the story of when Jesus calmed the storm. So what can we learn from that story? When we're in those difficult times in our life, God isn't panicking. God isn't going to be worried, just like Jesus wasn't in the boat. If we're going through difficult times, God knows what to do. And maybe the problem won't get sorted straight away, but we can know that God is with us, just like Jesus was with the disciples in the boat. Even though it was a really scary time, Jesus was with them in the boat. We need to remember that Jesus is our rescuer as well. He rescues us. He is with us in uh, difficult times but he also saves us 
We are saved because of Jesus. Because Jesus died on the cross, we are saved. And uh, that means we get to be in heaven uh, one day with, with God and with Jesus. And that will be amazing. And we are saved from that. He's rescued us from that. Just in the same way that he rescued his disciples. So remember, whatever you're going through in your life, God is with us. Whether it's difficulties at school or whether you're feeling sad or you're going through something tough in your life, then just remember that God is always with you. And uh, if we pray to him, then he'll listen to us and he really loves to listen to us. And he, he feels sad when we're going through difficult times too. So we can pray to God and he's with us in those times. Okay, so let's pray now. Lord God, thank you that you are always with us. Thank you that you're with us in those difficult times in our lives. I pray that you'll help us to remember to call on you when we're in those difficult times. I pray you'll be with us this week. And please be with our friends and family too. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, let's pray at this point. Father God, as we come before you today, uh, we come before you as a people in need of your grace and your mercy uh, as this pandemic continues and the ongoing restrictions affect us in all kinds of ways, uh, feelings of loneliness, uh, feelings of fatigue, um, perhaps even uh, a sense of despair at points. Uh, Lord, we want to pray that you would help us to look to you and to trust in you, the God who has uh, never, ever failed us and who never will fail us. Uh, Lord, we want to thank you that you have proven your great love and concern for us in sending your Son, the Lord Jesus, into our world to be our rescuer, to save us from the very thing which separates us from you, our sin and rebellion, when he came into our world and laid down his life for us at the cross and rose again. Lord, this is something that none of us ever deserved from you, but you uh, gave us this gift of salvation freely uh, out of your undeserved kindness towards us. Uh, Lord, we want to pray that we would uh, look to you in these days and that we would trust in your promises that you have given us in your word. Uh, you are a God who is faithful. You are a God who is true. You are a God who is kind and merciful to those who hope in you. And so, Lord, help us as your people this day to lay hold of these great promises that have never, ever failed your people in the past. Uh, may we, as your people today, uh, lay hold of these great promises just as our forefathers uh, have done in days past. Lord, we want to uh, pray for the preaching of your word today. We want to pray, Lord, that you would help us to listen and to respond in kind as you speak to us, as your word is read and taught. Uh, Lord, we want to pray, Lord, that you would encourage us. We want to pray, Lord, uh, that you would help us at our point of need this day. We want to pray, Lord, that we would look to Jesus more today than we ever have done as we hear you uh, speaking to us as your word is proclaimed. And Lord, we want to pray too, as each of us listen as in today, perhaps uh, some, of, some of us as of yet have never yet uh, come to truly know and embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour. Uh, Lord, we want to pray that this day today uh, you would draw us to him. We want to pray, Lord, that you would help us to behold him and to see him uh, for who uh, your word uh, reveals him to be. And so, Lord, help us, we pray. We want to pray, Lord, that you would uh, quicken our hearts and help us to 
uh, lay hold of your great promises uh, given to us in your word, the Bible. Lord, we want to pray for um, our nation and our community around about us today. Uh, we recognize, Lord, that many, many folks are struggling. Uh, people have lost jobs. Some people are unwell. Uh, some people uh, are in hospital uh, and suffering in all kinds of ways. Uh, Lord, we want to pray that you would be merciful and gracious to them. Uh, we want to pray, Lord, that you would help us um, to get alongside uh, the people round about us and to share with them the wonderful good news uh, concerning your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came into our world to save us from our sins and give us the certain hope of eternal life in himself. Uh, Lord, we want to pray that you would uh, help us uh, to be ambassadors of this great message uh, that has given us hope and joy even in difficult days. So Lord, we pray for our nation today. We pray for our community today. Uh, we pray, Lord, that they would come to know and experience your grace and mercy towards them uh, given to us in and through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we want to pray for Nathan as he would bring your word to us shortly. We pray, Lord, um, that you would help him uh, to speak your truth and to apply your truth to our lives. And we want to pray, Lord, that you would help us as we listen uh, to listen well and to respond well uh, to what you are saying to us this day. Lord, we thank you that you are a good God. You are a kind God. Uh, you are a merciful God. You do not treat us as our sins deserve to be treated. But in and through the cross of Christ, you give us forgiveness. You give us grace. Uh, you give us the certain hope of an eternity spent with you because Jesus, your son, paid the price for our sin and rose from the grave, uh, proving that even though one day we will die, uh, we will certainly rise again, because Jesus, our Savior, has conquered death for us, that we might uh, live with him uh, in eternity when he comes again. So, Lord, help us to lay hold of these great promises that you have given us this day, Encourage our hearts, we pray, for we ask all of these things in Jesus' great name. Amen. Well, let's turn to the Bible now, and we're back in 1 Samuel this week, 1 Samuel chapter 20. Grateful for Martin taking us through the, the previous two chapters, last week, 18 and 19, and we pick up the story now in chapter 20. This is what God's word says. Then David fled from Naoth at Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? Never, Jonathan replied. You are not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything great or small without letting me know. Why should he hide this from me? It isn't so. But David took an oath and said, Your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he will be grieved. Yet as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there is only a step between me and death. Jonathan said to David, Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it for you. So David said, Look, Tomorrow is the new moon feast and I am supposed to dine with the king. But let me go and hide in the field until the evening of the day after tomorrow. And if your father misses me at all, tell him, David earnestly asked my permission to hurry to Bethlehem, his hometown, because an annual sacrifice is being made there for his whole clan. If he says very well, then your servant is safe. But if he loses his temper, you can be sure that he is determined to harm me. 
As for you, show kindness to your servant, for you have brought him into a covenant with you before the Lord. If I am guilty, then kill me yourself. Why hand me over to your father? Never, Jonathan said. If I had the least inkling that my father was determined to harm you, wouldn't I tell you? David asked, who will tell me if your father answers you harshly? Come, Jonathan said, let's go out into the field. So they went there together. Then Jonathan said to David, I swear by the Lord, the God of Israel, that I will surely sound out my father by this time the day after tomorrow. If he is favorably disposed towards you, will I not send you word and let you know? But if my father intends to harm you, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away in peace. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. But show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live, so that I may not be killed. And do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan made David reaffirm his oath of love for him, because he loved him as he loved himself. Then Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow is the new moon feast. You will be missed because your seat will be empty. The day after tomorrow, towards evening, go to the place where you hid when this trouble began and wait by the stone Izel. I will shoot three arrows to the side of it and as though I were shooting at a target. Then I will send a boy and say, go, find the arrows. If I say to him, look, the arrows are on this side of you. Bring them here. Then come. Because as surely as the Lord lives, you are safe. There is no danger. But if I say to the boy, look, the arrows are beyond you, then you must go because the Lord has sent you away. And about the matter you and I discussed, remember the Lord is witness between you and me forever. So David hid in the field. And when the new moon feast came, the king sat down to eat. He sat in his customary place by the wall opposite Jonathan, and Abner sat next to Saul, but David's place was empty. Saul said nothing that day, for he thought something must have happened to David to make him ceremonially unclean. Surely he is unclean. But the next day, the second day of the month, David's place was empty again. Then Saul said to his son Jonathan, Why hasn't the son of Jesse come to the meal, either yesterday or today? Jonathan answered, David earnestly asked me for permission to go to Bethlehem. He said, let me go because our family is observing a sacrifice in the town and my brother has ordered me to be there. If I have found favor in your eyes, let me go to see my brothers. That is why he has not come to the king's table. Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan and he said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman, don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the, sa the shame of the mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me for he must die. Why should he be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asked his father. But Saul hurled his spear at him to kill him. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. Jonathan got up from the table in fierce anger. On that second day of the feast, he did not eat because he was grieved at his father's shameful treatment of David. In the morning, Jonathan went out to the field for his meeting with David. He had a small boy with him and he said to the boy, run and find the arrows that I shoot. As the boy ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. When the boy came to the place where Jonathan's arrow had fallen, Jonathan called out after him, Isn't the arrow beyond you? Then he shouted, Hurry, go quickly, don't stop. The boy picked up the arrow and returned to his master. And the boy knew nothing about all this, only Jonathan and David knew. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to the boy and said, Go, carry them back to town. 
After the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed before Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. Then they kissed each other and wept together, but David wept the most. Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left and Jonathan went back to the town. Well, I wonder uh, what the best friendship you've ever had was like. I wonder if you could think about that friendship just now. What does true friendship look like? And and what, what is the basis of great friendship? Well, today we are in this really wonderful chapter in, in first, cha- uh, first Samuel chapter 20, but it is a complex chapter for quite a lot of reasons. It's, it, it's intricate, the story is compelling, but quite complex, and as we'll see in a minute, there's also, there are also some, maybe some textual difficulties as, as well, but uh, it is a, a wonderful chapter that tells us about what f- true friendship looks like and the basis of true relationship, which is the security that comes from covenant, making covenants, and the greatest covenant of all found in the gospel of Jesus. Uh, And covenant is a a really powerful concept and and word. It is a, a form of binding oath. It is a solid and firm promise. It is a a clear commitment and it is a witnessed commitment and in the bible there are several key covenants promises binding agreements that are are made throughout the bible that culminate in the greatest covenant that comes between jesus and his people so we have the 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 covenant with abraham or abram back in genesis 12 We have the covenant with Noah that comes before that. We have the covenant with Moses. Uh, We have the covenant with David and the covenant with Christ observed for us still in the Lord's Supper, the new covenant with the blood of Jesus. It's a binding and solid oath of commitment. And in our passage today, covenant's right at the heart, this this binding oath and the, the everything that flows out of such a commitment is seen in this chapter, in this friendship. And it is, it is really something to behold. And so in chapter, in, in chapter 20, verse 8, that is really where the word covenant is. Verse 8, uh, as for you, show kindness to your servant, for you have brought him into a covenant with you. Note, before the Lord, it's witnessed. But it's it's throughout the chapter, the impact of that covenant is all the way through the whole story. It's right at the beginning where uh, David makes an oath, verse 3. And also there's oaths in verses 12 to 17. Uh, There's mention of Yahweh being the witness of oaths in verse 23. Saul makes reference to this commitment between Jonathan and David in verses 30 to 31. Jonathan refers to the covenant right at the end in verse 42 saying, Go in peace. We have sworn friendship. So covenant, this binding promise, witnessed and made between two parties is the, is the covering framework of this uh, intimate and intri- intricate story that we're reading here in First Samuel. It's, it's, it's riveting, it's compelling, it's complex, but I hope it's also clear in the gospel truth that we learn from it. There are difficulties and you know, to be honest with you, we don't usually try and uh, talk about them, not because it's not important to, to note difficulties, but because sometimes it's just not helpful uh, and it's background work. But, but, you know, we need to know that there are complexities in the text, but I'm going to highlight them only to show that actually we can still have clarity on what the Bible says. Some argue about the placement of this chapter in the book 
of Samuel. Why does chapter 20 come here, right after chapter 19, when Saul so clearly tries to kill David? I mean, that doesn't, doesn't make sense. David would obviously know not to go to the New Moon Festival after what's happened. So there must be something wrong. I think that overstates the case. Um, David doesn't want to, isn't unclear as to the fact that Saul wants to kill him. Rather, he wants to know why. He wants to know why uh, in, in verses 1 and 2. Saul's expectation of David at the New Moon Festival, some have questioned. But again, that, that reads too much. It, it does not take into account the culture of the day. When the king holds a feast, those at his table are to be there. And then there's Jonathan and, and David. What's going on there? I mean, I mean, d- does Jonathan not know about any of what, what's been happening? Uh, there are textual difficulties, specifically in verses 12 to 17. That, that is a notoriously hard part of Hebrew to translate into English. But the reason I say that is to say that we can still have confidence in the thrust of the text. That the message is still clear even if we can't quite uh, agree on some of the finer details of the words, the actual flow of the meaning of the text is really beyond question. That's helpful to know. And then there's the geography of this story. It's a wonderful story, and we follow and journey with David and Jonathan through several geographical locations, and the story unfolds as we move from set to set in this chapter. We start with David coming before Jonathan, maybe at his home, who knows? So we are before Jonathan, and then they go into the field, and then Jonathan goes to the table and he's at the table with Saul and then after that it goes back to the field again and and we're going to follow that path that geographical path as we go through the passage together just now and it starts before Jonathan David comes before Jonathan and here we see a covenant of refuge David flees and he goes to Jonathan and David wants to know why why is your dad father trying to kill me what's going on I don't understand and Jonathan is bewildered he's like what are you talking about I this is wrong you can't be you're you're mis you're mistaken David that's not what's happening and David says no I swear an oath before you this is how serious this is Jonathan, I'm telling you, I will take an oath. Your dad is trying to kill me. I am one step away from death. And Jonathan says, I'll do anything to help you. Covenant faithfulness displayed. And so they come up with a test. They discuss it, they chat it through and say, right, we're going to come up with a test to, to try and work out what's going. And David says, right, this is, this is what's going to happen. There's a new moon feast um, and, and, I'll, uh, and I'm not going to go, but you go and tell me how your dad reacts. That'll be the acid test as to whether or not I am mistaken or telling the truth. And David calls on the covenant that they have made before the Lord together. You see, David has gone to Jonathan. He's fled to Jonathan in, in his time of need. And he expects Jonathan, even though he is the son of of Saul. He expects Jonathan to honor the covenant they have made. He expects Jonathan to act with hesed. Hesed, that is the Hebrew word that we try and translate. We have no English word that directly relates to this hesed, this covenant love. We have various attempts at translation uh, here in, in chapter 20. NASB uh, translates it as deal kindly. The NJB, show faithful love. It's quite a rare term. It occurs 250 times in the Old Testament. The King James uses the word mercy. The RSV, steadfast love. The NIV, love. Are we getting a picture of this hesed that David 
expects from Jonathan. This, this kindly, faithful, merciful, reliable, steadfast love and commitment, this compassion and affection. But, but it's not just love. David, David expects loyal love. It's not just kindness, it's dependable kindness. It's not just affection, it is committed affection. It is hesed, covenant, faithful love. And David asks Jonathan to treat him with this devoted love. He comes to him in his time of need. He's desperate. He's confused. He goes to the place he knows he will be safe because they have taken an oath and a promise that they will treat each other with faithful, um, deliberate love in time of desperate need. And so in a covenant... In the covenant, the the covenant partner can expect and can rest in the security of the promises made. And he can appeal to those promises. And so in his time of great trouble, David flees to the place of refuge that he knows he can depend on. And that's Jonathan. We learn from David a lot That when we are in times of trouble and confusion, we take ourselves to the one who made a covenant with us. We can go to Jesus and by his blood and in his name, we have total security that he is our refuge. Total, dependable, reliable safety and security and refuge. Jesus' love for us will not crumble, though everything else may. Now this doesn't mean, and and God promises to us in Christ that when we come to him, it doesn't necessarily mean that we will just be totally safe from temporary harm, temporal harm. What I mean by that is, There is not really any promise in the Bible that if we come to God and trust in his promises in Jesus, there's not really anything in the Bible that says that means we will just be totally safe and secure and not suffer anything in this life. That doesn't, that doesn't, that's not said in God's words. But what we do have is absolute confidence that regardless of what we may suffer in our current lives, our future security and hope is absolutely secure. Our safety, our eternal life, our eternal joy and hope, our identity, our place of of journeying towards our new creation, our destiny cannot be taken away. Because God, the God who has promised it to us in Jesus is faithful and nothing that happens to us can take that away. Jesus then is the refuge that will not fail. But then we move into the field. Jonathan says, come with me, David, let's go into the field. And here we see a covenant of uncommon value and worth. You see, we have in verses 12 to 17, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting little part of the chapter. You could actually jump right from verse 11 to verse 18, and, and the story would flow totally naturally. And again, people have raised questions over that. Does that mean that some guy has come and edited this and slotted this in? Is this some false part? You know, is it being unhelpful? The answer is no. If there's a part of the story that is added in and breaks up the flow of the passage, that tells us something. It tells us this is worth taking note of. It's been done deliberately so that we learn from what is being said. That's a common tool of writing. It brings our eyes to focus on what is being said. It's significant. Now, there are textual difficulties in these verses, but the main point is clear. The main point is clear. 
And so in verses 12 to 13, I'm, I'm reading a, a different translation here by uh, a guy called Dale Ralph Davis. He, this is verse 12 to 13. Yahweh, God of Israel, when I search out my father about tomorrow this time or the third day, and should it be good news for David, will I not then send to you and make you aware of it? May Yahweh deal harshly, all the more so with Jonathan, if it is my father's intention to bring disaster on you. I shall make you aware of it, send you away, and you shall go in peace. And may Yahweh be with you as he has been with my father. Friends, this covenant that David and Jonathan has made is crazy. It's bonkers. It's amazing. But let's just examine what's going on here in these promises that David and Jonathan have made to each other. We need to think about this. This is, this is a crazy thing that Jonathan has just said to David. It's wonderful, but it's mind-blowing. It's so countercultural. what Jonathan is. Who is Jonathan? Who is Jonathan? He is the crown prince. He's the next in line to the throne. He is the future king of Israel, according to Saul's line. He is the, he is the next in line to the throne. And culture says, you destroy your enemy. He's got a threat. He's got this David guy, this threat to the throne. Culture says, kill him. Kill him now. Protect your throne. Protect your name. Protect your lineage. But Jonathan says, no. Jonathan says, I swear before Yahweh to send you away in peace and safety. I mean, that makes no political sense. That's not what kings did. It's just so weird, but so wonderful. Jonathan commits to honoring and protecting David because of the covenant they have made. But the, the weirdness doesn't stop there. The weirdness continues because Jonathan then asks David for more. This is what he asks David for in verse 14. And will you not, if I am still alive, will you not treat me with the devoted love of Yahweh that I not die? And you must not cut off your devoted love from my house forever, not even when Yahweh cuts off each one of David's enemies from the face of the ground. So Jonathan cut a covenant with the house of David. That's crazy. Because Jonathan then asks David, when he is king, deal kindly with me. Deal kindly with me. Honor the covenant. Honor our promises. Honor our friendship, David. Deal kindly with me when my father is gone and when you are on the throne. And unbelievably, David agrees. Wow. Wow. Again, that makes no sense. The accepted norm in the culture of the day, especially when you are the new king on the throne, is that you, you cull, you get rid of your adversaries, you get rid of your enemies. Consolidation by liquidation is what you did. But David promises with a steadfast love to honor Jonathan and his family. Culture and politics are telling Jonathan and David to do otherwise. But the covenant that they have between each other preaches faithfulness and love and security. And therefore, this is a covenant of uncommon value that promotes faithfulness over the culture of the day. We have so much to learn, friends, about what it means to be faithful to Jesus from the friendship of Jonathan and David. Jonathan and David made promises to each other that, that, that flew in the face of the culture of the day. And we know that Jesus, he is the greater and more valuable partner in our covenant. And when our culture demands certain things of us, Jesus' way calls us to a better and greater way. The gospel of Jesus calls us to a better way of living. 
to a better future. It calls us to be countercultural in many ways. We are called to be faithful to Jesus over and above our culture that may place demands on us that we cannot bear. And Jesus promises to be faithful with us to the end. Not that we will live in total uh, tranquility. We may die. But Jesus will remain faithful even after death. What a powerful, powerful call the gospel places on us. What a, a powerful confidence it gives us that when we enter into relationship with Jesus, he commits to us that no matter what, even if we die, he will keep us safe. And we promise when we come and commit our life to Jesus that we will follow Jesus and, pr and proclaim the gospel of goodness and grace and redemption no matter what our culture says. And actually, the role of the church and of the gospel in our land and in our culture is to proclaim goodness and truth even when it is not wanted to be heard. So we stand on the truth. We stand and, and, and speak into our culture on matters of importance like uh, like the, the, the value of human life and of human dignity, like uh, what, the, what God has to say on sexuality and gender identity, what the Bible has to say on morality, what the Bible has to say about the only message of hope for a dark world. We stand with Jesus. And Jesus' covenant is of greater value than any promise our current culture can give. And then we move and go to the table, the table of Saul. And here we witness a covenant that costs much but rewards far more. And so we get to the, the, the table and, and Saul's trying to play it cool to begin with. Uh, we have Saul's question in, in verse 27. Where's, where's David? Where is he? Where's he gone? Then we have Jonathan's revelation. Well, Dad, he's gone to Bethlehem. May it please you so. His brothers have called him. He's gone to give a sacrifice. Well, then we see Saul's anger, his true nature come out in verse 30. He, he's livid. He's furious. He rages. Then we have Jonathan's question. Well, what, what has David done? Why do you want to kill him? Then we have Saul's revelation as he grabs a spear and tries to kill Jonathan as well as David. And then we have Jonathan's anger at the unjustness and wickedness of his father against David. So Jonathan counted the cost. He counted the cost of the covenant of faithful love he has made with David it's unbelievable. The crown prince puts God's servant, David, God's king, David, God's word, God's kingdom first, not his own. It's incredible. And, and, and Saul actually sees that in verse 31. He says, you and your kingdom, you know, he, he recognizes that. He's saying to Jonathan, your kingdom is gonna, not going to survive. Jonathan says, I know. I know, but I belong to a greater kingdom. What an incredible counting of the cost by Jonathan. Wonderful. What a, what a witness to us. You see, many rulers, just, they, they don't understand God and his kingdom. Being a ruler puts you in a place of authority that can so often inflate the ego and make us think, well, it's about my kingdom and what I can do and how I can lead and my legacy. But the reality is there is only one God and only one kingdom. And Jonathan embodies gospel faithfulness to the king of kings. He, he embodies the words of Paul in, uh, verse, in, in, in Philippians uh, chapter 3, verse 7. 
Paul says, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Jonathan has counted the cost and has trusted in a greater covenant and a greater promise than any earthly legacy he may read. Jonathan uh, understands the cost of being in relationship not only with uh, David, but with the God of David. And David, as the servant of God, he knows what that cost is that Jesus speaks of in Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And Jonathan has understood that. He understands what is a wonderfully liberating truth that lasting reward is not in establishing our own kingdom, but in belonging to the kingdom of God. Do we grasp that, friends? Lasting reward does not come from making your own name, making my own name, leaving a legacy. Lasting reward comes from belonging and being secure in the covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. And that says much to us about how we view our careers. Well, what honors Christ? It may be a wonderful career. That may well be it. Or it may mean that we have to make decisions and count the cost and our career would not go as far as it would have done because we have had to make decisions to be faithful to Christ. It it says much about how we raise our families, what decisions we make about everything. It says much to how we choose and make and form relationships. Are these good relationships? Are these healthy relationships? Are these God-honoring relationships? It says much about how we view church. What are we doing when we gather? What are we doing? Are we counting the cost and reaping the rewards? Or do we reap the whirlwind? You see, relationship with Jesus costs much, but God's kingdom is of greater reward. And then we move back to the field again. And here we see the peace flowing from the covenant. And we have this young boy, Jonathan takes this young boy uh, as agreed and they go to the field and David's hiding and, and Jonathan is shouting and he says it's gone beyond and, 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 and then the boy goes and gets it, he doesn't have a clue what's going on but Jonathan and David then see that the coast is clear and they come and they embrace and they talk, they weep and then Jonathan says in verse 42, Uh, Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying the Lord is witness between me and you and between your descendants and my descendants forever. And then they left. You see, the covenant promises peace. It promises peace. Now, let's be very clear about what that means. What does peace look like? Well, what does peace look like here? It doesn't mean tranquility for David. He's fleeing for his life. And biblical peace does not equal tranquility and total rest in this life. That's not biblical peace. Rather, biblical peace is peace amidst the chaos. The covenant relationship with Christ that we enjoy promises us, promises us peace even in the midst of chaos and harm and destruction and anything else we may experience. Whatever happens, we can have peace in hardship. The covenant of grace in the gospel, by the blood of Jesus, through the Spirit, with the Father, is a covenant of overflowing peace. You 
You see, Jesus offers a greater friendship than even the one we view here in chapter 20, which is perhaps one of the greatest friendships ever recorded in all of history, Jonathan and David. But Jesus is a greater friend than Jonathan or David. Friendship and relationship with Jesus is greater, better, more longer lasting. It's sealed with a better covenant. It's overflowing with a greater peace. We witness this covenant relationship every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. The Lord's Supper reminds us and points us to Christ's death and resurrection by the cross and the empty grave. It reminds us of the salvation that we have totally secure. It gives us peace because we know we do not need to fear the judgment of God because we have peace through the blood of Jesus. And the Lord's Supper fills us with a hope of future peace and future rest that nothing that we experience in this life can destroy or take away from us. It doesn't mean we're going to have tranquil lives. There might be chaos. But like Jonathan and David, we must take a stand on the covenant relationship that is ours and see it as greater and better than any other option available to us. And we must trust in God's covenant of peace and grace in Jesus. He promises us peace and hope and life and refuge and security. And we are to be the messengers of a better covenant, a better way, a better truth, a better peace, a better friendship, a better relationship, a better joy than anything our culture or world can give.
God himself has paid the price That all who trust in him today Find healing in his sacrifice That all who trust in him today Find healing you